Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we're going to continue our exploration of hypothesis testing in the R programming language and explore how to do a chi-square test or a contingency table test for independence between two categorical variables. So the first thing that you need to do is have a data set to work with. I've already inputted a data set for us to work on, at least to this demonstration, which is stored in this particular CSV file. To get an idea of the type of data set that I'm working with, so you can sort of modify what type of data you have, or maybe you want to copy the exact same data set that I have, it pretty much has a bunch of genres for movies, and whether people drink soda, eat popcorn, and the combinations of either one of these two, um, and the frequencies of responses for some survey um, that these people probably distributed um, to a bunch of people who went to the movies um, for each of these particular movie formats, right? So let's assume that this is our data. So what we want to test with the chi-square test for independence is do we have evidence to believe that these two categoricals are independent from one another based upon the frequency distribution in each of these cells, right? So that's the test that we're trying to execute here. So the first thing that I need to do is to get all of my data in one place. Notice here that my first column is actually not a column of my frequencies. So the first thing that I need to do is get rid of that. So the first thing that I want to do is say that my observed values are gonna be equal to this, my data matrix, all rows except the first column. And to easily do that, you can just, just do brace, nothing written in the first cell, comma, minus one. That's going to delete the first column of that particular matrix that you're referencing. So if we give that a run and then call that particular matrix there, notice that here I just have a matrix of all the frequencies for my particular cells that I'm interested in working on. Once I have all of my data values, in particular my observed data values, now what I want to do is calculate how many rows and how many columns do I have in this particular matrix, which could vary depending on your data set. So NR is going to correspond to the number of rows. So I can get the number of rows and the number of columns via the dimension function. So I can do DIM of this observed value matrix. The first element is going to be the number of rows. The second element is going to be the number of columns. So notice here that I have six rows. Therefore, once I run this, I should have a value returned of six. And C is going to correspond to the number of columns in my data set. So that's going to be DIM of my observed value matrix. And then I'm going to return the second value. That's going to give me the number of columns. In this particular data set, I have four columns. Therefore, once I run this, I should get a value of four for NC. The next thing I need to do is figure out how many people did I sample across all possible cells. You can either do the sum of your row total or the sum of your column total. But we haven't got the sum of our row totals or our column totals yet. So let's get that done first. So the first thing that I need to figure out is, okay, what is my column total sums? I'm just going to call it SCOL for sum of my columns. There's a nice function R called COL SUMS, which is going to calculate the column sums of a particular matrix. In particular, we want the column sums of the matrix observed value. The next thing I want to do is do all of my row sums. So S row is going to be equal to COL of rows. So you can do COL of, or row sum actually. So row sums of my observed value. And that's going to give you all of your sums. And then we can take the N to be the sum of all of our column values. Or you could do the sum of your row values. You should get the same answer. So for in this particular data set, again, our observed value are all of these values here in this cell. If you add up all of these numbers, you can either do it individually, add up the rows and add up them, add up the columns, add up them. In either case, you're going to get 375, if you're working with this particular data set at least. So that gives us our observed values, the row totals, the column totals, and the grand total of all the frequencies observed. Now we're ready to build our expected value matrix, which we're going to compare to our observed values to determine if there's evidence to believe that these are independent variables. So the first thing that I want to do is create a new matrix. Let's call it expval for the expected values. And let's assume that we want to create a matrix that's full of nothing. 
and then we're just going to fill it cell by cell. The easiest way to do this is via the matrix command. So matrix, the values in this matrix are gonna be a bunch of NAs. NAs just means just not a number or not applicable, just empty things. The number of rows that we want this matrix to have, so n row, is gonna be equal to nr. The number of columns is gonna be equal to nc as we've already defined. And that's gonna create a blank matrix of the same exact size as our observed value matrix. If we sort of give that a run and run that, notice that we have an expected value matrix with six rows, four columns, same dimension as our observed values, except it's blank now, or at least sort of blank, because it has no meaning to us. So if you don't remember how to calculate each of these cells, for example, the cell 1, 1, we're going to do the sum of row 1 times the sum of column 1 divided by the total sum. So sum of row 1 times the sum of column 1 divided by m. Then we're going to do for row 1, column 2, sum of row 1 times sum of column 2 all over m all the way down to this bottom corner cell, so row six, column four, which would be the sum of row six times the sum of column four divided by m. There are matrix ways of doing this very quickly, but I'm just gonna do a double for loop since our ends are pretty small. So what I want to do is I want to do a double for loop, so I'm gonna go cell by cell and calculate all of them. So I'm gonna use i and j for my for loop indices. So for i in the interval one to nr, so that's going to march across my rows, and then for j and 1 to nc, that's going to march across my columns. So the expected value, in particular row i, column j, is going to be equal to the sum of row i times the sum of column j divided by m. That's going to calculate the expected value for each of my cells. So if I give that for loop a run and then return the expected value matrix, that's going to give me my expected frequencies for each of my cells, which is what I want. The next thing that I want to do is compare my expected frequencies, which are given to be this matrix here, and then my observed frequencies, which we've already observed from our data set given above, which is this. If these two matrices imply independence, their cell values should be exactly equal to each other, right? So obviously 50 and 56 are not equal to each other, but one may argue that they are close. Same thing can be said about 7.16 and 8, 15.37 and 12. So obviously, the minimum value that we can have when we subtract them and square them would be zero. And if we sum that across all six by four cells, then that should give us 24 different submetrics in order to conduct our independence test. The chi-square test statistic, which I'm just gonna call CSTAT, is calculated as follows. So if you do the sum of, for example, a matrix, it's gonna give you a vector. And if you do the sum of the sum, that's gonna give you a number, which is what we want. So what we want to do is we want to sum all the values in our observed minus the expected. And once we have that difference, we're going to square that. Because when we're summing, we don't want the positive and the negative differences to cancel. In order for this to be a chi-square test statistic, we need to divide by the expected value frequency. Now keep in mind, if you're not familiar with how R does exponentiation and division and multiplication, these are element-wise elements. So this is going to do it for all cells, rows, and columns. You don't need a for loop for that. So this object right here is a matrix. And if you do the sum of a matrix, that gives you the sum of those totals, which you could call, for example, sub chi-score test statistics. And the sum of those baby test statistics is your totals test statistic, which is why we do sum of sum, since we have a two-dimensional array here. So once we give that a run, we're going to have a C stat approximately equal to 10.86. Keep in mind, we're testing for independence. If they truly are exactly independent, then we should have a c-stat of zero. Obviously, c-stat is not equal to zero, it's positive. But is it super large positive is the question that we want to answer. Usually to answer that, we compare it to a critical value, but most people will just calculate a p-value associated to this test statistic and compare that to whatever alpha value you want to compare it to. So the first thing that we need to do is calculate the degrees of freedom for this particular chi-square test for independence. 
For a chi-square test for independence, the degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. Once you have the degrees of freedom, now we can calculate our p-value. So the p-value, in case you don't already know, is going to be p chi skew because it's a chi-squared random variable. That's why we're using a chi-squared test statistic. We're going to reference our chi-squared test statistic. We're going to, let's get rid of that q because that's not going to run. Uh, give it our degrees of freedom, and since our rejection region is when our test statistic is super large, this is going to be a right tail test. Therefore, we're going to calculate this from the right tail, which means lower tail must be equal to false. Once we have that, then we can give that a run, and that's going to give us our p-value. Notice that our p-value here is 0 0.7623. Some people usually use a base reference number of about 5%, or 0 0.05. Notice that if our p-value is larger than our alpha, then we have evidence to believe that they are independent, because we have evidence to believe that this number 10 is statistically close to zero. And that's how you do a chi-square test for independence, or a contingency table test in R. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.